أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح لله ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم له ملك السماوات والأرض يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير والأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله الكريم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل علي على علي أمير المؤمنين اللهم صل على الإمام الحسن المشتبى اللهم صل على إمام الحسين أبا عبد الله شهيد كربلاء صل على محمد وآل محمد <تصفيق> My dear brothers and sisters and respected viewers, I'm asking you tonight to, inshallah, um, go on a journey with me, where we will, inshallah, the intention for these nights we have is to really go deeper into the reality of Karbala and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So I'm going to ask you at the outset to set an intention to go deep with me. We're going to go beyond the surface level of analysis. So I ask you to activate that part of your mind that is seeking depth and not just surface level analysis. We would say in primary school back in my days, put your thinking caps on if you... Uh, Back in the 90s when we were in school, the late 80s and 90s. Probably a saying they still say. So I'm going to ask you, inshallah, to put your thinking caps on. Because this will, inshallah, this series of lectures will be uh, intellectual and academic. Because this is what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the message of Karbala deserves. So I'm going to set the stage that the caliber of the talk is going to be academic but not so irrelevant that it's going to be over anyone's head, inshallah. But it's important that each night, and I, I want us, inshallah, at the beginning, even though it's a small group here, that we make a commitment that we attend each night because each talk is going to connect a series of dots. And I want to promise you, inshallah, if you bear with me, you will, inshallah, come away with an understanding that will take you to another level, inshallah ta'ala, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawfiq. So, the intention I've set is to understand the mission of Imam al Hussein in its widest context. So, the way I want you to think about it is a set of concentric circles. You know, like in archery, you've got the bullseye, and around the bullseye you have another circle, and then another. that's what a set of concentric circles is. Circles within circles. And usually within the lectures, during the days and nights of Muharram, the speaker goes straight into the heart of the topic, maybe discussing history, maybe discussing the uh, valiant struggle of Imam al Hussein, maybe discussing the sociological aspect that Imam al Hussein stood up against a tyrant, my approach is going to be different. We're going to zoom right out in this lecture to the widest context possible for understanding Karbala. And that is, in the technical term, this is called ontology. I'm going to, I'm going to come to that. But ontology basically is comes from the Greek ontos, which means being or existence, and logi, which means the study. So we're going to ground Karbala tonight in the in existence itself. And what is that? Who is that? Brother Saeed recited uh, Ayat al-Kursi. 
the existence, what we would say existence as such, is who? Who is existence? Who is the foundation of existence? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al-hay al-qayyum. He has the attribute of existence. He is existence. Not that he, he has the attribute of existence. He is al-hay. He is existence. So everything that exists borrows from his existence. This is ontology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ground of all reality, the ground of all being. So this is the widest context in which we can understand Karbala. So I'm not going to be situate, situating the tragedy of Karbala tonight, in, not in history, nothing wrong with that. Historical analysis is important. Not in politics, not in sociology, not even in theology, but in ontology. The nature of ultimate reality. Tonight we want to awaken our intellect and go deeper because Karbala, we have to understand that we have to put ourselves in the consciousness of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, who is he? He is Khalifatullah al Ardi. What does that mean? He is the divine representative of the God of the universe on earth. Can there be a higher status than that? The divinely appointed human. If we were to use terms that maybe the younger children don't understand, he's like the king on planet earth. But not a king like an earthly king with a crown and a kingdom, but a king in that he has authority sacred authority, religious authority. It's like when a king goes through a coronation ceremony and he's crowned king. right? So Imam al Hussein is designated as the representative of Allah on earth. This is who Imam al Hussein is. Not just an ordinary man, not just a righteous man. And this is how Imam al Hussein understood his mission. He didn't understand his mission as as purely a, a geopolitical reality that he's this um, one man in this place in the Middle East and there's a bad guy called Yazid and he has to like hold a, a placard against Yazid to engage in a protest. No, that is a surface level understanding. There is a metaphysical reality to Karbala. A reality where Imam al Hussein fully and perfectly was aware of who, who God is and his relationship to Allah, to God Almighty, who governs the universe. Imam Ali salam, informs us in Sermon 1 of Nahjul Balagha that the uh, foremost in religion, the principle, is Ma'rifatullah, Awaluddin Ma'rifatuhu. And ma'rifa doesn't just mean to have knowledge of God, theological knowledge, theoretical knowledge. No, ma'rifa means that you, you, you have absorbed into your essence a level of awareness of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Let me give you an example. Someone may have knowledge of nutrition, encyclopedic knowledge about calories and protein and the biochemistry and the Krebs cycle and glycolysis, but they may be obese or overweight or diabetic. So that knowledge, has it penetrated into their essence? Because if it had, they would have a level of awareness. When they would see food, they would say, hmm, you know that food? No, not for me. They wouldn't have to use their willpower. They would have an awareness. They would have their aql would be awakened. They would have a level of awareness. Their mental light would be illuminated by that ma'rifa, by that awareness. That's why in Arabic we have a saying: if someone is gluttonous, we say ambiyakul balawai, meaning he's eating without awareness. Had he, if he was aware of what he's doing, he wouldn't eat like that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Recognition, Hassan. Recognition. And recognition means you are remembering something that you knew 
in a previous reality. Recognize. Right? So, if we are going to begin to understand Karbala, and I'm going to take you on a journey, if you will attend these 10 nights we have planned, inshallah. An intellectual journey, if you will be with me. And I feel very, very happy to be in this small gathering because this caliber of discussion is not for a 1,000 people crowd. So it must be special. <laughs> Inshallah. And I must say the uh, recitation of the brother in Urdu was beautiful. I picked up a few words. but where's, Is the brother still here? Beautiful. Beautiful. It brought me to tears even though I didn't understand obviously the names of the Imams alayhi salam and Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. So Karbala is ultimately situated in the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to begin with Allah because this is where Imam al-Husayn begins and ends. If we look at the words of our holy Imam, his last supplication on the day of Ashura, he says, Oh Allah, your status is sublime and your power is great. Your strategy is profound and you are independent of all creation. Your grandeur is magnificent. You are capable of whatever you wish. Look at the, the awareness that Imam al Hussein has in the moments before his tragic, horrific death. The awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He begins and ends with Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'un. Your grandeur is magnificent. You are capable of whatever you wish. Compassionate and true to the promise of abundant grace who sets a fine test. You are close to the one who calls you the supervisor, controller of whatever you have created, acceptant of whoever repents or returns to you capable of doing whatever you desire if you think about it if you think about it without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the forefront of our consciousness when we think about Karbala Karbala is a senseless meaningless human tragedy that makes no sense bloodshed and misery and depravity and the depths of human evil and foolishness. It makes no sense. This is why one of the philosophies that has gripped the modern world is called nihilism. Nihilism says, look, this world is all, all this hodgepodge of chaos and calamity. It's meaningless. You've you got to make up your own meaning. Without Allah SWT as the axis, as the center, you are Karbala becomes atomized. Each one looks at it from his perspective. The sociologist, the historian, the, the politician, all valid. But what captures this essence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the reality of Allah. So we must begin by understanding who Allah is. Who is God? For the young people, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the name of God. So we can say God in English. We say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Arabic. This is the name of God gives himself when he reveals himself directly to us through his book, the Quran. Imam al Hussein salam fully understood who God is. Because as God's chief representative on earth, when he was the Imam, he had the highest level of recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humanly possible. His recognition, his awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reached a level of human perfection. Perfection on the human plane. Right? This, is the, this is the man we are talking about. Now, if you will bear with me, you will begin to understand that the tragedy of Karbala is not just a, a sociological tragedy, a theological tragedy, a earthly tragedy. It is a cosmic tragedy. And if you'll bear with me, you're going to understand why this is a cosmic calamity that befell Imam al-Husayn 
And this is why, because of his ma'rifah, his level of recognition of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, he was able to fully submit to this cosmic test. Because really, I'm going to give you a little teaser. Imam al Hussein's sacrifice held together the earth held this very existence, this earth plane together. This was the weight that was put on this man's shoulders. The weight of the continued existence of earth. And some would scoff at that. Some would say that's ridiculous. But this is a, we're going to go through blow by blow to prove this. So the three big questions which we will inshallah be addressing in this lecture series dedicated to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam are number one, who is God according to the Quran? Again, if we don't know who Allah is and if we don't situate Karbala within knowledge of Allah, then Karbala becomes atomized. Each person takes a different perspective of it. Ultimately, it's grounded in who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's sacrifice was grounded in his understanding of the reality of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as the governor, as the king, as the absolute authority over this universe. And his sacrifice was in order to bring this earth plane into congruence, into alignment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's laws that govern this earth because they were out of alignment. So who is God according to the Quran is the first question. And we answer this from the Quran. This is called Quranic ontology. From the Greek ontos and logi, meaning the ultimate reality, being or existence. This is what we'll cover tonight. Two, how and why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create the universe? This is Quranic cosmology. So from ontology, from awareness of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the universe. He creates the cosmos. He creates the universe. This is cosmology. From the Greek cosmos, meaning order, government, universe. What was Imam al Hussein's mission? It was a cosmological mission because the earth plane had gone into disorder, into chaos. So his mission has a cosmological aspect. And the third question who is the human being? Who is insan? according to the Quran and what is his and what is his purpose and this is called Quranic anthropology from the Greek anthropos meaning human and logi study so we're going to cover ontology existence itself who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cosmology the creation of the universe and how that's connected to ontology and then anthropology who is man and who is Imam al Hussein as the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how does his mission as the vicegerent the khalifatullah ala arbi how does that connect to cosmology the created order of the universe and how does that connect to ontology Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we're going to cover ontology cosmology and then anthropology And then we can begin to extract lessons from each of these oceans of knowledge which we'll cover. So tonight, we're going to go through Quranic ontology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all existence. So now we turn to an understanding of God from the Quran. The Quran gives us the most sublime, pure, profound understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing himself to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all existence. He is the foundation of all of reality. Meaning all that exists borrows from him. Borrows from his nur. Borrows from his life. All of reality is in a state of constant, de constant dependence on God, yet God is independent from all reality. In philosophy, God is known as the independent being, absolute being, or necessary being. 
Meaning that if everything in existence, that includes the entire universe, is in, in constant motion, constant movement, the planets, the solar system, the galaxies, the atoms at a subatomic level, the subatomic particles, the quarks, and your physical body and the biomechanics, everything is in motion, then any, th any body that's in motion had to have a beginning. No body can give itself its own motion. For the ch kids, it, like, it needed something to give it a push, right? Can't push itself. So if the universe is everything that exists, Allah SWT in philosophy is known as the prime mover, the first cause. You need Allah, you need God to get the universe into motion because it can't kickstart itself. Matter cannot create matter. So Allah SWT is Badi'u samawati wal ard. He is the originator. He is al fatir He is the origin of everything. This is the reality of Allah. The absolute independence that He has. That He is self-existent. Now you're saying, the brother's talking about the attributes of Allah. Very important because if you don't understand this first lecture... The other sequences are going to make sense. So Allah SWT is the necessary being and everything is dependent on Him. Meaning everything else is called in philosophy a contingent being. Meaning it's not necessary to exist. The universe doesn't have to exist. A lemon doesn't need to exist. You are not a necessary being. A necessary being is a being that is self-existent, that all other existence borrows from His existence but no one created him. Right? Now, the Quran gives us secret knowledge about Allah SWT. And we're just scratching the surface. I want you to be aware of what allowed Imam al Hussein Hussain to go through the calamity that he went through of cosmic proportions was this Ma'rifatullah. He had an intimate knowledge of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. He did not, his, the relationship he had with God and the recognition was not the God of the philosophers, wasn't theoretical. This was an intimate connection with who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. And by extension, so did his companions. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for them to submit and pass this test. Because the human ego, the nafs, right? In such a situation, the overwhelming majority would say, "I need to. I, I'm out. I, I, you know, your faith is really going to be tested. Whether you truly believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as a as the ultimate reality." So, in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us who He is. He's revealing secrets about Himself. He's the king of the universe. He is the governor of this universe. He is the master over all of creation. Everything begins and ends with him. He has no beginning and he's no end. He is azali. He is eternal. In English they say he's the ancient of days. He's al-qadim. Pre-existing. بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَإِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ To him belongs the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, Be and it is, the divine kun, the divine command, through his speech, not with a mouth, not with words, metaphysically, through his speech, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the kun, creates. Now this creation is not taking a template, is not rearranging pre-existing material. It is creation out of what? Out of what does Allah create out of? He creates out of nothing. Nothing. In Greek, creation ex nihilo. Imam al-Sadiq when asked, how did God create? He said he created out of nothing. No mold, no template, no raw material. 
He simply, through the divine kun, kun fayakun, being it is. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna mathali Isa and Allahi ka mathali Adam khalaqahu min turabin thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. Indeed, the similitude of Adam in the sight of God, the, sight, and the, the similitude of Jesus in the sight of God is, is like that of Adam. He created him from clay, then said, be, and he was. So this is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He creates an orderly universe. Now we're going to talk about creation tomorrow. Today is just the focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understanding God as the reality that governs everything. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير. Blessed is he in whose hand lies sovereignty. Metaphysically, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't have a hand, and he is powerful over all things. And of course, in the Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of all universes, all realities is Allah. God is real. He is living. He's self-existing and he manages the affairs of the universe. He creates through his divine speech a divine command, the divine kun, kun fayakun. Through his speech, reality comes into existence. Things begin to take form. God creates through the mechanism of divine descent. The term for this that is used often is tajalli, manifestation, meaning in the Quranic conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, creation is a top-down process, not bottom-up. In the Quranic cosmology, matter doesn't, life doesn't emerge from dead matter, bottom-up. Life emerges top down. Divine descent. Creation is top down, not bottom up. Yudabbirul amra min as samai ila al ardi, thumma yarjuu ilayhi fi yawmin kana mikdaruhu alfa sanatin mimman ta'ud, mimma, mimma, mimma ta'uddun. He directs the whole affair from heaven to earth. Then it will ascend to him on a day whose length is a thousand years by your reckoning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala governs the universe, creates and is constantly sustaining all his creatures. He's another secret the Quran reveals from his khaza'in, from his treasuries, from his depositories, from his storehouses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has storehouses. Khaza'in. وَإِن مِن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا عِنْدَ خَزَائِنْ إِلَّا عِنْدَنَا خَزَائِنُهُ وَمَا نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدْرٍ مَعْلُومٍ And there is not a thing, but that which is with us, its depositories, and we do not send it down except according to a known measure. Now, if you have a storehouse or a warehouse on earth, and you're manufacturing something, once you've manufactured that thing, the raw material that was in the warehouse is no longer there, right? You've moved it off the pallet. It's no longer there. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his treasuries are never exhausted. When he creates something and he sustains something, like he's sustaining you, he's sustaining the universe, the billions of galaxies, the planetary bodies, your heartbeat, every atom, every subatomic particle, that is being sustained from the highest heavenly realm down to the earth realm through various levels of, of descent. But those treasures in the highest realm never get exhausted. So this defies our laws of physics because when you access something from a storehouse or you remove a jewel from a safe, that thing is no longer in the first location, it's moved. So one example that scholars give is like knowledge. When you access your knowledge, you don't lose it. It's somewhere in a way in a metaphysical realm. Now we know even neurobiologically that memories is very doubtful whether they're actually stored in the neuron. 
that your brain cells are acting at like a quantum computer connecting to the cloud, the quantum system, rather than you are storing things in like your hard drive in your brain. Your brain is like a supercomputer conductor with the cloud called the quantum realm. So this gives us a glimpse of the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creator. His treasuries, his bounties defy the normal laws of physics that govern our reality. He has ultimate power and knowledge. He is the source of all power and knowledge. Meaning, he encompasses all ilm, all knowledge. He has all power. You know the famous verse where Allah says, If all the trees on earth were pens and the oceans were ink, refilled by seven other oceans, the words of Allah would not be exhausted. Surely Allah is almighty, all wise. Now, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Alim. Now here's the thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so munazzah, so glorified, so powerful that his divine power cannot come directly from the highest realm. If you read about the Isra al-Ma'raj, uh, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was taken up by Jibra'il to a level where Jibra'il told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I have to stop here. If I go any higher, I will be incinerated. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reached a level that was very, very close. Within two bows length. Now this is a metaphysical realm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the, in, the, in the vertical chain, which is not physical, His power cannot descend directly onto the earth. Because if it did, what would happen? the earth would be destroyed. Too powerful. So the power has to be modulated through the seven heavens, through the angels. Like a power station, if you plug the power station straight into your house, what's going to happen without it being modulated? It's going to blow up your house. This is the enormous power of Allah. He's governing the entire universe. This is not abstract. This is the divine reality we live in. God has angels which execute his commands perfectly and modulate his power through various levels of reality until they reach the earth plane. By the time it reaches the earth plane, then you have tajalli, manifestation. Then you're born. Then the embryo takes shape. Then the flower blooms. But everything you see here has a representation in the metaphysical realm and is sustained in that realm through God's khazain, through God's treasuries. This is the reality that Imam Hussein salam was conscious of during Karbala. This is the reality that he's conscious of. This is, this is the amana that he's holding as God's representative. وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ and to Allah prostrates whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. So like we said, if God's power manifested directly, it would be destroyed. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله Had we sent down this Quran upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and coming apart from the fear of Allah. Allah SWT is so powerful that His power cannot be directly sent down to this earth realm. This earth realm is very fragile. We're governed by many, many laws, divine laws, universal laws. However, and I'm going to end with this, the whole purpose of my talk is to reawaken within you that we live in a God-centered universe. We live in what we call sacred space. Because unless you understand the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as he describes himself in the Quran, you begin to occupy what's called a profane existence. This comes from the work of uh, a famous anthropologist called Mercia Eliadi. And Eliadi pointed out that modern man doesn't have anything called sacred space. 
He has horizontalized his reality. Everywhere he looks, there's, there's, no, there's no God. There's nothing sacred. The shopping malls, the concrete jungles, the building. That's why he's depressed. He's cut off from the vertical reality. This is what I want to reawaken with you, that we live in a reality. Yes, we live in a horizontal realm on the earth, but it is connected to a vertical reality. The realm of the angels, the realm of the metaphysical realm, the realm of the Malakut, the, 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 the unseen kingdom, the Chaza'en, and ultimately the realm that is beyond, 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 which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond anything that you can imagine. لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار. No vision can seize him, but he sees us all vision. Unless you and I awaken to the divine reality that we live in a world, in an earth, connected to this vertical realm, connected to this vertical pillar, to heaven, we succumb to various forms of ghafla or sleeplessness. And this is what happened to the enemies of Imam al Hussein on the battlefield. So can you imagine the level of awareness that Imam al Hussein had? He is fully plugged in. Now why is he plugged into that vertical axis? Why is he plugged into that column to heaven, even though he's on earth? Because he's the imam. He's the hujja. He's what's called the axis mundi. He's the pivot. He's actually holding the two planes together. If there's no imam on the earth, what happens? Earth is rent asunder, cannot exist. So he is the holding point. He's what's called the axis mundi. He is metaphysically the center of the universe. He's containing on his shoulders this amana. And when we speak of it politically, it is to restore the nation of his grandfather. But now you've understood metaphysically and cosmically how huge this amana was that rested on the shoulders of Imam al-Hussain because it's grounded in the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we're going to do tomorrow night inshallah is we're going to move from the knowledge of Allah, ontology, to Allah as creator, cosmology. And then we're going to begin to connect it with what, why Imam al-Hussain took the stand he took from this much deeper perspective. I hope that's been of some... Um, benefit to you i know it's a bit heavy the topic but in a nutshell what i want you to take away is to reawaken within you that you live in a world permeated filled with the divine reality of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the world that you live in is conspiring to make you asleep to this reality and this is why all of us must create in our lives Areas of sacred space. When you stand on your prayer mat, that's a sacred space because it connects the earth with heaven. When you do your tasbih, that's a sacred space. You're connecting heaven and earth. When you recite salawat, when you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you look at a tree and you think of the grandeur of that tree and how it is being sustained in a metaphysical realm, when you contemplate on the reality of the angels, this is awakening within you a level of God consciousness that is just a, a, a taste of the level of God consciousness that Imam al-Hussein had because he had supreme God consciousness. This is why he could fulfill the cosmic test he fulfilled. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.